I've been I've been gone for a couple weeks because we had a campus retreat, and then I was visiting my girlfriend in Miami, and then yeah, I think that was it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So it's so good to be be back together. I really I really did truly miss you guys. Um, first off, just want to give a little shout out to Veterans Day. I uh, appreciate everyone who has uh, served in the military or, or uh, yeah. supported that in any way. Thank you. Yeah. Grandma and my mom were awesome military wives. So, so, love you guys. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, also, I uh, also want to give a little uh, sad announcement. Um, this past week, uh, Patty Headland did pass away. Um, so yeah, we just want to. Uh, I want to take a little bit of time for prayer for that, and uh, just say, so, uh, you know, just be, be mindful of this, uh, be supportive of family members and things like that. So uh, yeah, super super sad to see someone go, but uh, I just like to uh, have have a little bit of time for prayer right now. Um, dear Lord God, uh, God, we really do mourn, mourn the loss of Patty. Um, we pray that you should accept her and, 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 uh, yeah, and uh, carry, carry her along to the second, um, into eternity, God. And, and we do pray that you can comfort and, and guide uh, uh, her family members and those that she uh, left behind. And God, we do really mourn, mourn her loss. And uh, we're, we're grateful that you are a good God, too, that uh, is eager to comfort and, and uh, uh, be an advocate for us, too, God. But it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to John 16. We're, we're continuing in our sermon series through the book of John called Rise to the Light of Life. Um, and the title of my, my lesson today is Befriend Conviction. Um, and so I kind of want to start out with, with a, a, a little story. Uh, there's this leadership expert by the name of Jim Collins. And he's, he taught at Stanford and, and was, has done a lot of research into, okay, what makes businesses and organizations be really successful? And, and how, how can, what, what are the things in their, in their organization, in their culture, that, that brings them to lots of success? And he had this, this desire and drive to, 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 figure, to figure this out. And he studied tons and tons and tons of companies, thousands, and found 11 companies that went from good to great. That they first, they were doing decent, like not, not terrible, but not amazing. But then over some time, these companies that were average, they went to uh, lead, kind of leading the market in, in their respective fields. And so he studied these 11 companies really, really in depth to find out what, what made these companies so incredible and so successful. And, and then he posted his, uh, his findings in a book called Good to Great, which is incredible, incredible read. Um, but one of the things that these, each of these companies do is that their leadership teams are, are super focused on finding the best solution, and they, they, are, they, they do not care about offending each other. And in their, in their, uh, in their leadership meetings, it can, they can get in really heated arguments uh, and, and argue, like, Get, go back and forth really strongly between each other um, in order justifying anything that's that's constructive for the ultimate result. And they don't care about uh, you know who whose solution was it or who proposed this, but but they they are really focused on all right what is the solution and, and how can we grow and then how, how people feel or whatever like those those are secondary things. And they, they can, sometimes, it, it's said in the book, they can, get, they can get overly heated. So, you know, we're Christians. We're not going to try to imitate that exactly. But we, we have something to learn from this that they have discovered a really godly principle that when you embrace uh, being wrong and embrace trying to find the best solution, you will be blessed and, and benefit incredibly. And, and God, obviously, God knows this and, and is willing to give that same blessing to us that we might find success and, and benefit and be blessed in our lives. A little different than, than how the companies go about it. But when we embrace being wrong and truly finding, okay, what, what is best in our life and dump, dump how we feel or um, whatever obstacle that, that may be, we will be really blessed in what we do. So, yeah, you can look in uh, John 16, verse 5 to 11. Um, and my first point is the Spirit convicts. So verse 5, this is Jesus speaking to his 12 uh, apostles here. He says, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief, 
because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And for me, the, the work of the Holy Spirit was always kind of like a like mysterious thing. Like, it was probably pretty clear. All right, God the Father, you know, he's like up in the sky and over all. And Jesus, he was the physical man and, and died for our sins. But the Spirit, the Spirit was always something that was a, a little less tact, like, tact, uh, tactile to, to me. But here, it's, it's, it's really great that Jesus describes exactly what the Holy Spirit does. And one of the core, core identities and works of the Holy Spirit is that he proves the world wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Another word for this is, is to convict or, or to expose. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a core, core work of God in our lives. Um, and, and to be convicted, this doesn't just mean to be accused. This isn't just a proposal right. by God or a thought or right. an opinion. Oh, you know, I, that might be kind of wrong. But if, if you're convicted in a legal sense, you are guilty. Like, it's... This is, this is God saying, all right, what, what you are doing in regards to sin or what you feel like is, is right and may, may be subpar. This isn't just an opinion, but this is God's, this is God's ruling. All right, this, this is guilty. This is wrong. Um, and and you, you will be proven wrong in that. Or about judgment, which is the third thing that, that, the, that Jesus is saying here. Judgment being, okay, who, who is truly saved? Who is truly going to be in the right? When, when it all comes down to it. Um, and and this, this is a primary work of the Holy Spirit. And it can seem harsh. It, you know, I think in our culture, the, to be judged, that's like the big no-no. Right. You know, right. in a culture where, where the world really, really values tolerance. Yes. Um, this, is, this is kind of, this is really counter-culture. But it is also, this is the work of God. So it, it is therefore good. And, and we need it. We really need it. It's also totally the pathway to conversion and to further Christ-likeness in current disciples. Um, Jesus, even here, Jesus wasn't afraid to, to really lay down the law because he knew that this was for, for the benefit. Um, even, if, even if you can look back in, into your own life, and how you became a disciple or, or how you, you have grown in your faith. If you look back at those moments that were pivotal, that really brought you a lot of blessing, and you were convicted, weren't you? Yeah. I, I remember like when I, when I studied out sin or discipleship or what repentance and baptism was, I was like, oh man, that hurts. Wow. <laughs> I did not know how arrogant I was and that that was just not okay. Um, I kind of knew, but when I looked at the scriptures, it was like, oh man, I, yeah. I'm really in trouble here. Right? And, and even, even now, when, when, I look at, when I look at different scriptures, I'm like, oh, oh like, like, wow, that, that kind of hurts. Like, I, I, feel, I feel this kind of guilt or, or this feeling of, of wrongness. And again, in our culture, that's, that's, that's a no. Like, it, a lot of times, if you were to tell someone else, okay, you're living in a wrong way, people are like, oh, like, like, who are you to tell me? You know, I, just let me do my own thing. You do you. And we can mind our own business. And I have my own value set. And yeah. You can't tell me what's wrong. But, you know, with Jesus, that's, that's kind of uh, not true. Right? Yeah. Jesus, has, right. Jesus has an objective, yeah. an objective standard of what, what is true about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Right. And so, so for you, this, we, we have to know that the work of God is, is convicting people. And it, it does bring you, it, it is a blessing. And we have to embrace it. And if you were to reject the, the conviction, uh, that, that the, the Holy Spirit convicting you in, in whatever way, that is, that is rejecting the work of God. And that is rejecting God's efforts in your life. Whether, and it can, the, the Spirit convicts people in, in tons and tons of different ways. God is definitely creative. And He knows, he knows how, how to get to you. Whether it's simply reading your Bible and, and you come across something, examining your whole life, and you're like, wow, 
I'm definitely not doing that. You know, or, or hearing something at, at church or brother or sister comes up and talks to you or maybe you just like, you're thinking and God just puts something on your heart. You're like, wow, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways that the Spirit goes about convicting your heart. And we have to know that this, this is of God. And this doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, every time someone corrects you, this is straight from God and you have to listen to it. You know, that's, right. that's not true. That's, that's overly extreme. But most of the time, whenever there's something convicting you, this is coming from God. This, this, this is the work of the Spirit in your life. And, and we, can't, we can't push away God or, or reject Him. Yeah. But we really have to, to listen and embrace, embrace God. This is something incredibly valuable. Even though it can feel, maybe coming from our culture, be a little anti-authority or, um, or against, against you know, objective standards. Like it can feel kind of maybe aggressive or, or harsh to some. But it, here in this scripture, Jesus taught that this was more valuable than him physically being on earth. Again, um, my second point for today is that conviction is worth Jesus leaving. Look again in verse 5. It says, Jesus says, But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask where you're going. Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. Here's the, here's the big thing. Very truly, I tell you. Not just regular truly. Very truly. I, told, I tell you, it is, for, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, advocate will not come to you. And when the advocate, and Jesus says later, when he comes, he will, what? Bring conviction, prove the world wrong. Jesus says, it is for your good. This is for your benefit. It's better than Jesus' physical presence that it, for you to have conviction. And, and not only is, Jesus, is this applicable for us today, but he's, he's even telling this to his 12 disciples right here. And so, if, if you could just think for a second, like, whoa, what do you think these disciples are thinking? Because they must have gotten some serious benefits from having Jesus physically there, right? Like, if you've watched The Chosen, you can see, you can see like, the, their life really, really uh, be visualized. But, you know, how, how Jesus pulled people out of, of meaningless fisherman jobs or, or pulled them out of, of demeaning tax collector, tax collector jobs in Matthew and being, being shamed, or pulling all these people to, to be, have the honor and respect of being a disciple of the Messiah, right. be part of something incredible, where before they were just doing meaningless things. You could think these people, these people, whenever they were being faithless, he would help them just exactly, the exact correct right scripture, the exact right way to approach them, to, to build them up and to strengthen them. Or if they were, they were feeling un, un, like very low, he'd know exactly what to do to comfort them. He'd heal their mother-in-laws and go about you know, doing all these things. You know, he, he, he knew them. He had a very intimate, intimate relationship with his disciples. Um, he, um, he, he, uh, he saw you. He was, he was really with them fully. It must have been incredibly valuable for the disciples to have Jesus physically there. But Jesus is saying to them and to us here today that the power of the Spirit in conviction is more valuable than what they had. And so for us today, man, what a treasure it is that we have the Spirit working amongst us to bring us conviction. What a blessing it is. And, and Jesus knew this well. He said he, he, was, he was even willing to fill them with grief. To do this. And it's not just like, oh, you know, I'm kind of sad, like a little bit of grief. I dropped my ice cream cone on the side on the sidewalk, whatever. No, they were they were filled with grief. Yeah. Not just some, a lot, like full consuming, oh my goodness, my Messiah is leaving me. What am I gonna do? You know, I I, I if, if you were at this time making all your hope in the physical person of Jesus, You'd be pretty stressed, like, oh man, what, what am I supposed to do? Like, I, I got no more options. What's going to happen? So here Jesus is comforting him, saying, okay, this is going to be better once you have the Spirit moving. Um, and, and then you will have conviction. And um, this, this is similar to even, even the physical body and, and physical pain, too. The, the value of 
conviction. And so there's this condition, it's called SIPA. It, it stands for congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis. And the, pretty much the, this condition means that you, you can't feel any pain and you can't feel any temperature changes. And it, you know, that might seem kind of nice. Oh, cool, like, I never have to feel any pain. That'd be, that'd be kind of nice, right? Never get hot, never get cold. Like if you stub your toe, you don't feel it, you can just chill, right? However, this condition is considered very dangerous. Yes. Yeah. And most people don't even live past 25 years old. And their, their lifestyles have to be constantly checking themselves for, for cuts or bruises um, or, or other injuries. And, and maybe constantly checking the temperature to, to see, okay, is this too hot? Like, is, is this damaging my body? Because they lack the ability to sense where there is damage or dysfunction in their body yeah and that is incredibly dangerous yeah. and leads to a lot of damage in their lives and that's that's why they do die quickly and so same with us spiritually we die quickly if you can't see where there's damage mm. or dysfunction right in your life sin sin the, 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 um, the consequence of sin is death you know that you, you can say that that leads to hell yeah Totally, but also like any sin that has a root in your life, it does bring it just it just damages you and, and pulls you down and, and tarnishes your soul. And if, if you don't hear if you don't hear God's emotions into your life to tell you, hey, where is there damage? Where is there dysfunction in your life? It's it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well. So that's why it's such a blessing. That we have the spirit to bring about conviction. Yeah. And, and, and if God if God wasn't able to speak to you and, and to move you to push you away from these things, man, what what damage would you uh, experience? Now I want to I want to ask you guys a question, and and I really want you to pause and think about this one. What would your life look like if you were never convicted? Mm. Oh. If you just had, if, if there was no presence of God telling you what's right and what's wrong, you know, there's no moral standards, there's no motion of God to kind of point you, what would your life look like? It would be pretty rough, wouldn't it? <laughs> Man, I know, I know, I need that. And I think before, and probably when I was a kid, like I, did, I didn't really like being convicted. Oh, you know, you're wrong. Ah, you know, come on. Like, let me just do my thing. But, but now, now I, I, think, I think I've developed like, this love of being convicted. It's kind of like, oh, yes, like, I, I, love, I love being sharpened and, and shaped to, to be able to grow and, and, and experience more blessing in Christ, to receive more and more, God, more and more of God in my life. That I know he's just going to bless me, so the more I can bump out the other stuff and increase, uh, increase the godliness in my life. Woo, yes, give it to me. Give me it all. And we have to have that, that same attitude. Yeah. Um, and it, it does, it, it is truly beneficial for other people as well. You have to believe that and know that, right? Um, and I know it, it can be, it's, I say it's probably easier to apply to yourself. Like, okay, you know, I can really bring some conviction on myself, but do I necessarily want to, like, inhibit someone else or make them feel bad? Because when you're convicted, you do feel bad, like you're guilty, Right? So if you love them, typically, you're not going to extend that as much. But Jesus here, he was, he was very okay with letting his disciples be very convicted. Or letting the Pharisees or anyone else be very convicted. And again, he, filled, he was willing and kind of eager to fill these people with grief. And, and leave them in pain for a temporary time that they might benefit even further. And so we need, we need to... Extend that to other people too if we do love them because it is for the good. I remember studying Bible with Chase, my man, who's an absolute beast. Um, and when we when we studied out sin, Chase was like like super cut to the heart because he's crazy humble and whatnot. Um, and I was like, man, first I was like, yes, he's going, love it. Uh, but then after that, we were about to study the cross, and I was like, all right, this guy's like already like hurting from knowing about his sin. Should I try to like like soften the cross some, you know, and, and make it not pack as much of a punch so that 
so that he won't like feel as bad that you know he caused the death of Jesus. Maybe I just won't hit that as much or kind of leave him. Just, oh, you know, God loves you so much. That's that's it. Um, but then I was like, man, like I would be softening it, but that would be hurting Chase in the long term, yeah. Yeah. not to convict him more. Yeah. He really needs that. And so then I didn't soften it at all. Like, all right, and also softening it, that's deceitful. Like, this is the truth. Like, what, what, this is the Bible. What am I supposed to do? You know? And so uh, I, I, think, I think that did really help Chase like, grow, and now he's even more of a spiritual beast than whatever. What 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 <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it, was for, it was for his benefit. And it, so we got to be willing to hurt each other some, too. And, and, you know, there's tact and there's gentleness and stuff, but, you know, let it. Be okay to let something hurt some people, right? This is this is the way of Jesus. We need that. And I think at the root of this, the reason why Jesus is doing this is because He truly values your holistic salvation more than temporary comfort or grief. Mm. And with with being saved, being saved, like disciples are, are continuously being saved. Like it's not just all right. Once you're baptized, boom, got the check, save button. Or just say that's that's true. You, you do you have you are in the kingdom, but we're continually shaped and and, and blessed and, and saved from our sin. We're continually growing and get to move further and further past our sin and more and more into the kingdom life, which is such a blessing. And Jesus really knows this. He really knows this. He believes in it, um, and we we have to do that too. And then on top of that, Jesus was trying to be a friend to us. He would, he, he would, you know, there's there's two pieces there. He knows that this is valuable to us, and he cares enough to apply that to us. So he really is our friend, um, and you know, because he is our friend, we need to embrace our friend. That's my third point: is to embrace your friend. Here in, in John 16, Jesus uses the specifically uses the word advocate to describe the Holy Spirit. And there's there's multiple different. Um, uh, it, multiple different references of of what uh, the Holy Spirit is described as, whether it's um, comforter or spirit of truth. A little bit later in chapter sixteen, and and even in the message version, the message version uses the word friend to describe the Spirit. But ultimately, what an advocate is is someone who has your back, who's who's willing to go to the, to the next people and say, "Okay, I'm I'm going to stand by this person and and proclaim for them." Defend them. And I'm I'm for this person. And so, and, and then right after that, Jesus describes this advocate, someone who is for you, the Spirit who is for you, and brings on all the conviction stuff. And so we have to know that okay, our friend, the Holy Spirit, is going to bring us conviction. And so with friends, like it, with friends, you, you keep them close, right? Yeah. You spend time with them. You listen to them. You open your heart to them. You trust that they're for you. You don't shove them away, but, but you really you really bring them close. You look forward to spending time with them, right? I know for me, my girlfriend, she's coming back to Ohio, 246 hours. I know. She's, uh, I'm excited to see her. I'm excited to see her. Friends tell each other the truth. I know my brother. <laughs> My twin brother, we're super tight, obviously. Um, but he tells me, like, he tells me the truth. He doesn't, he doesn't sugarcoat it at all. He tells me, kind of, kind of all the time. Mitchell, you're bad at singing. I think you're good. I know what you're thinking, but you're bad. I've lived through my entire life. You're bad at singing. And I don't, you know, I, I know he's for me. I trust he's for me. I, it's funny. I kind of disagree with him. I think I'm good. But you know, as my friend. He tells me the truth, and it helps me grow. You know, it's a little wrong, but... Is our friend and brings us to 
the big shit. We gotta be excited and embrace yeah, yeah, on, bro. our friend. Yeah, yeah. Um, Proverbs twenty-seven six says, "Wounds from a friend can be trusted." Amen. But an enemy multiplies kisses. Yeah. And as the Spirit is our friend, the wounds that He gives us can be trusted. They can be trusted. And know that this is this is really good for me. So today, do you trust the wounds that God is giving you? Mm, that's a good question. Oh, uh, there you go. Come on. Do you know, do you know that these are for your benefits? Mm -hmm. Do you see them as something to, oh, you know, scary back, you know, or that hurts, just kind of subconsciously push that away. Do you, you really trust that and, and bring, bring it? And, and especially as friends, you know, if the Spirit is your friend, you don't push them away. With friends, just inherently, you spend time with them. So, my point here, don't ghost the spirit. <laughs> if you don't know what ghosting is, ghosting, this is kind of a young people term, in case you don't know. But it's, yeah, it's when you just like, don't text people back, or they keep messaging you, you just block them, you know, and, and don't, don't, don't listen to them. Maybe they, maybe they keep texting you or keep calling you, but you do not respond. Right. Don't ghost the spirit. You can't evade the spirit. And this is, this is challenging because being convicted is inherently hard. That's an inherently uncomfortable thing. Yeah. And it's really easy to just you know silence your conscience and push, push it away, ignore him and his promptings, and leave him on red, right? But you literally read it and then leave and that's it. Um, but we have, to, we have to embrace our friend. He, there's an example in, in Acts 24 of someone who kind of goes to the spirit. Uh, Acts 24, verse 24. Uh, Paul, Paul is in prison and, and he's on trial. And so he's he's on trial, but still sharing his faith anyways. And in verse 24, he's uh, he's testifying before Governor Felix. It says, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Come on, Paul, share your faith at all times. Um, then as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Sound familiar? Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Yeah. Yeah. The same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. So here, Felix, he's, he's listening to Paul. He's, he's even, he's even kind of intentional about it, spending the time to go and hear the word of God and what faith in Christ Jesus was. But... He is, he really has blocked off the spirit. And he's running yeah, from yeah. being convicted because, why? He was afraid. He was afraid. And so, for us, there's, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of ways to flee conviction or, or ghost the spirit. Um, you, could, you could go to excuses. Like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't got time or I'm too busy or, uh, you know, there's, there's too many things going on in my life. I don't know. That's, that's probably the one I go to the most. Um, or you can go to theological reasoning or, or debate. Oh, you know, I, you know, I got, you know, this context. Uh, yeah. You're trying to really, honestly, it's just evade the simple truth that, you know, maybe you're hard-hearted. And there's definitely space for, for the depths of the Bible. I love digging in there. But ultimately, we, we got to have that, that soft heart to embrace the Spirit as your friend and embrace conviction as your friend. Yeah. Maybe you say you forgot. Like, oh, you know, I read that, but it, like, there's, I just forgot. Well, was that forgetting really fueled by your desire not to deal with the sin mm. or trying to push away, push away God's work? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe you're like Felix here and you just got some cowardice in your life. Cowardice is definitely a sin. That's totally a sin. Yeah. I think we don't, we don't, I, I feel like I haven't, I, I, I feel like our culture doesn't value bravery a lot anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you on. see a lot of people becoming more and more timid, Come on. and that's just okay, like, oh, you're afraid, that's okay, you know. Yeah. That's, that's, that's still a sin, right? If there's godliness there, and you don't, you don't obey and trust that because you're afraid, how is that not a sin? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we have to, we have to listen to this. Or... At the absolute worst, simply telling God no. Like, All right, God, you're convicting me of this. You're telling me this thing, but I just don't want to. 
by shove it underneath the rug. And there's, I, I think there's really value in, in coming to God and saying, okay, God, I pray this. I definitely pray this when I'm wrestling with this. I'm like, God, I, right now, I totally don't want to do this. I'm just going to be honest. And being honest with God is great. Wrestle. Yes, yes. Just open the floodgates of your heart to God. But if you have that heart of disobedience and you yes. say no and you, you're not willing to talk to him about it, right. man, that is probably, that's probably the most dangerous thing. Yeah. And as for us, I, I feel like a lot of people in this room, you know that it's really valuable to be convicted. I feel like, I feel like we know that. But the, the problem is really believing it and getting out of the thought habit of resisting or fleeing conviction. Yeah. Really embracing and, and bringing conviction close to your heart and letting God move you. I'm reading this book called The Discipline Life right now by Richard Taylor. And he has this quote about, um, pretty much about doing hard things. And he says, this psychological block to, to do hard things is irrational because the resistance is not intelligent opposition to specific disciplines, which in themselves are wrong, but impulsive and habitual opposition to all restraint, right or wrong, and particularly that restraint or opposition, which may happen to cross one's desires and impulses of the moment. And so I've been, I, I, I feel like the, the biggest challenge in, in Christ-likeness isn't, isn't just knowing, okay, what, what the scriptures are and in what is the doctrine, but letting that and trusting it into pulling it into your life completely and really believing it. Because we all know, we all know sin, sin is awful and destructive, right? Yeah. But, but are you willing to pull it into every aspect of your life and really believe it and, and fulfill the word of God into your life? Because this really is a blessing. Being convicted is such, such, such a blessing. This is a core part of who God is and why the Spirit was willing to come. Jesus knew it was so valuable that he was willing to leave this earth, to grieve his disciples, to bring this presence of conviction on us and on the world. Because he knew, man, this is friendship to us. This is what it means to be close to us. And I want to charge you to befriend conviction. This is your friend. This is... This is, your, this is for your benefit. This is your advocate speaking to you. Embrace him. Friend conviction. And let it, let it run your life. Amen. Amen. Amen.